right, so good morning, folks. Christopher Dagger right here at the Theology Department for, once again, episode 12 for Off Bishop Street 2.0, our department podcast. And I have the joy this morning of having Dr. Uri Shalev this time uh, with us, uh, on the show. And uh, I pronounced it right, so it's Uri Shalev. It's Uri Shalev. Right, yeah, <laughs> so I had a mistake. <laughs> I initially made a mistake the first time I said Uri, but it's, it's Uri, yeah. Uri Shalev, great. And uh, I'm very excited today because we're going to be talking about uh, psychology, um, the different effects on, of drugs on uh, different, you know, on organisms. And I believe Uri did uh, some, some tests in the past on, uh, on different uh, subjects. Uh, mostly, you know, I was reading the, the effects of leptin, or the, the variations of leptin um, in different animal tissues. So um, we'll definitely dive into that and uh, talk about, all about that. But um, first and foremost, like um, the interest that I had initially when to have you over was really to branch, you know, the theology discipline with some, the psychology discipline, even though it's a far stretch, I feel like there are elements or denominators that are in common between the both. And, um, you know, I'd like to go the conservative route of starting with your background and how it came to be that you chose psychology as a discipline and a, and a focus or a field of focus rather than, um, than, than to help right away and then to the theory. Uh, sure. So first of all, um, uh, I'm a professor at the Department of Psychology here at Concordia. I'm uh, the co-director of the uh, Center for Studies in Behavioral and Neurobiology. So my path into psychology is actually not, uh, not kind of uh, straightforward. Uh, my interest was more in uh, behavior, uh, general behavior, not necessarily human psychology. And I'm more interested in the underlying um, brain activity, the brain is the organ that uh, is the major uh, focus of interest for me. Um, so I started uh, my master's actually was in uh, uh, animal studies in the Department of Agriculture in, 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 uh, in Israel and then I transferred into a PhD in psychology but I guess I wouldn't say that I'm a psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology <laughs> but uh, my uh, interest and uh, my uh, area of research is more in neurobiology side of it, so what explains behavior from uh, looking at the underlying brain mechanisms. Um, that also involves study of psychological processes, uh, and the subjects that I work with are, um, uh, work with animals only, so rats uh, at the moment, so all my studies are done uh, with rats. Um, I don't know, where do we roll from here? So yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's, it's great that we, you know, delved into like your master's degree and there are a lot of aspects about your profile, like on the Concordia page, but as well on the Explore page that really triggered my interest, you know, um, you know, being from Israel. Um, I'm not from Israel though, I'm from Lebanon, <laughs> neighboring country. Well, my, my parents are from Lebanon, I'm, I'm grown Canadian. Um, so there are these, you know, uh, different aspects about around psychology that, uh, that seem to be interesting to me because I actually completed a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. I don't come from the theology field, but then I started developing uh, growing interests in the humanities more than the actually hard, actual hard sciences. So the hard sciences were great to have that solid foundation with, with concrete, pragmatic material. But then I started asking myself more abstract, existential questions, and that really pushed me toward theology. But I've always had a keen interest in, in psychology. You know, I'm a big, um, I'm, a, I'm an avid reader of, um, or not an avid reader, but a big fan of uh, you know Jordan Peterson, uh, who is a clinical psychologist, and he kind of segued into the, the theology realm more or less. So you said you, you worked with uh, a lot of rats, and the first time I saw a rat was back in college because we were, you had to do like a, a an anatomy test on um, on a dead rat and understand like well, you know what, what organs play what role in, in the human body. So it was basic biology, um, you know. Let's try to bring you back to the first time you had to deal with, with a rat, like it, to, to, to deal with a live animal, right? I mean, it's, it's, we don't see a live rat every day, right? So uh, how did that go for you the first time around? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's also a, a generational thing. At the time, 
uh, the awareness to um, um, working with animals and actually using animals as food. Uh, it was, it existed, I mean, there were always, uh, I guess, vegetarians and uh, so on, but uh, the awareness was not as keen as it is now, so it was a more natural process. I mean, you go into uh, school, uh, it could be even at the level of high school, uh, you start seeing animals or parts of animals in your physiology classes, biology classes, and uh, it's not such a dramatic um, step to these animals in research, uh, or wasn't at the time. That said, um, this is something I also tell my students, uh, you should always have, a, you always need to feel a bit uncomfortable or at least have this awareness that we are um, using animals in research to the benefit of human knowledge or maybe human health, hopefully. Uh, and if you don't feel that something is maybe wrong with you, uh, even though we are using really uh, quite a few animals in research, that's, that's how it goes. Um, over the years, over many years of research, uh, we go to many uh, groups of animals and if you lose that feeling that those are cognizant creatures uh, that do feel, uh, have emotions, probably, uh, it's a, a totally other different discussion, what are emotions, uh, but uh, they definitely feel pain, they definitely can or elated or excited. Uh, this is something you always need to keep in mind and be very grateful uh, that uh, you can do that and be very respectful and try to, of course, minimize uh, pain as much as possible. Uh, so this is something that just uh, you always have to keep it in order to uh, not lose too kind of uh, rough or, or too blunt. Uh, so uh, this is, I guess, just something that I'm trying to uh, uh, convey to my students. Uh, but uh, for me, when I started, this was a very natural process. I mean, we started at a very early age to yeah, uh, interact with animal or animal parts in research or in, in school. So. Uh, it was not as dramatic as it might be today, for better or for worse. Yeah, well, there is that, um, you know, that, that existing debate right now with regards to like animal safety or whatever, you know, animal cruelty and time for research. Mm -hmm. But then again, like it's, it, it really tears me in half because when I try to inject myself into the debate and try to understand what uh, side of the coin I want wish to be on, I can't really pick because on one side I do see a lot of benefits. Uh, you know, with you know, uh, working with with different animals and, and and using those those raw vents or animals for um, for a greater good for a greater purpose. But at the same time, a lot of people may have uh, that different perspective that you know it, it might be cruel to you know from from a psychological point of view, but cruel to, to use to perform different techniques on on animals and such. Did did you have to wrestle with that debate at any point? Like yeah, you know, I still do. At some point, if you go into this area of neurobiology, there are no alternatives. Uh, if you are looking into to understand animal behaviors and microsites, the influence of, on, of drugs on, on, on the brain and, and behavior, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, there is just no other alternative. If it's a behavior, something needs to behave in order to study it. So for us, at the moment, there is just no other uh, option. It's not that people are keen on uh, hurting other creatures, it's just that really, there is, at the moment, there is just no alternative. Now, could the human uh, species could make, could come up with a decision, okay, we just don't care. We are not interested in understanding those behaviors. We'll 
deal with it ourselves or by studying humans only or developing what we call in sync or more so coming to artificial models. And there are such models when we understand about their behavior enough to build a model. So if, I don't know, as a, uh, I guess as a society or as a species, we decide that this is it. We don't use animals for food, we don't use animals for research, then it's possible it would slow everything down. Uh, of course, uh, though, I mean, all the uh, enormous advances in health research would probably also suffer. Again, there's just no way around it. Uh, but that might be a price that we will be willing to, to pay. Um, so it, it is something that I think about. It's not to just, you know, you think about it once, 30 years ago, and that's it. Uh, at least for me, uh, this is something that uh, comes up. But I guess for me, there is just, uh, I can't identify any alternative uh, to advance my studies, to advance the information, or to get the information that I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, so that's what it is at the moment. Well, yeah, it's and it's good that you you actually have that that thought at the forefront, you know, to have that uh, um, yeah, consideration and you know because. There are, you know, the, the, the debate can actually go into the, the, the hunting sphere where people may be against, you know, uh, hunting or folks having rifles to go around and just, you know, hunt animals. But then again, like, you know, primitive uh, civilizations were reliant on hunting in order to feed their families and that kind of thing. And that was the case up until like 300 years ago when, you know, before, before we had grocery shops and stores and, you know, access to, to meat and fish and whatever. And you know, I'm not going to segue into that particular debate, but now that we've um, you know we've touched the point about animals and just a little bit of the ethics around it, around animals and the fact that you know that ethical issue is always at the forefront, um, I did read that you worked on on leptin, and I remember back in my biochemistry studies, leptin was a major topic when I took a higher level biochemistry course, and we worked with leptin in the lab, as I recall. When and was that? About about what year was that? Oh, that was a long time ago. That was, uh, I would say, 2014-15, you know, back then. So I'm pretty sure that research has been developed over the past eight years. No, it's actually not that long ago, but it's a matter of perspective. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you were saying? Yeah, I was going to ask, like, uh, what, could you tell us more about your work with leptin and the, the, the areas of research? Yeah, I actually uh, haven't worked with leptin for a while now. Uh, as you said, it was... <laughs> <laughs> the peak of interest uh, at some point. I think even earlier than that, uh, leptin is a hormone that is... Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to ask later. <laughs> yeah. if you're so, but what, for what leptin is, we all have leptin in our bodies, so professors can probably explain what lept, the importance of leptin, basically. Yeah, and call me Uli, uh, <laughs> professor. Uh, and the, the, it's a hormone that is released from uh, fatty cells, from fat cells. And it's a signal from the body that you have enough energy reserves. The, the energy reserves of the body are stored in those fat cells. So uh, the major source for leptin comes from those cells. Uh, it's released to the bloodstream, it gets to the brain, and then uh, it interacts with certain targets in the brain to just reduce appetite. Uh, it's a signal to the, uh, to the brain that, okay, we have enough energy, we can stop eating. Uh, so when that was discovered, there were all kinds of uh, very interesting studies that came out. They showed that if, in, that was in mice at the time, that if you can uh, remove completely uh, the ability either to produce leptin or to uh, interact or to receive leptin to get the signal, uh, those mice would just not stop eating. They became like really furballs. And on the other hand, it's like magic. If a mouse that could not produce leptin is getting an injection of leptin or injections of leptin, uh, that works like a miracle. They become normal again, they uh, have regular or almost regular uh, feeding cycles and so on. So at the time that was thought to be the solution to uh, uh, 
uh, could there be a problem with overweight? The problem all you need is just every once in a while to get, uh, yeah, that's one of those examples. Make sure that every once in a while uh, you get an injection of leptin or a tablet or whatever, so lots of millions change hands uh, at a time, and then it turns out that it doesn't happen. And the issue is that in the whole world, I don't know, there are maybe 15 people that have this problem of not producing leptin, and those, for those people, uh, Leptin would work like magic. Mm -hmm. uh, it would just cure cure them. There, there would be no again other from being really clinically obese. They will become uh, long weight and so on. Uh, but for most people, the problem is that uh, they have enough leptin. Actually, they have too much leptin. They just the body stops reacting to leptin, and that you can inject as much leptin as you want. That will not solve anything. Uh, so that was a big disappointment, but over the time, it also uh, the, one of the other things that we realized is that there are many, many targets in the brain for leptin, and leptin probably has many more roles than just a simple signal from uh, the periphery to the brain. Uh, it affects development of the brain over development uh, of the uh, uh, individual. Uh, it affects uh, reward processes, and the way that we kind of perceive rewarding stimuli. Uh, and that kind of uh, started a, kind of a parallel uh, path for research about just uh, investigating the effect of leptin on uh, reward processes in the brain. Mm -hmm. Starting from generic rewards not related to drugs, and then what we tried do later is to see if that would affect uh, drug seeking, in our case it was heroin uh, seeking in an animal model. And it worked very well, at least under some circumstances, in food deprived animals, it, it worked quite well. And we tried to kind of uh, generalize that to other types of manipulations, and it turned out that it's not as efficient as we hoped. Um, so I kind of dropped uh, out of the leptin um, research in the last, uh, in, in, well, it was almost 10 years that I haven't done anything with leptin. People still do some research on that, but definitely the interest went down dramatically. Uh, another thing popped up, that another hormone is called ghrelin. Ghrelin is the opposite of leptin. Mm -hmm. it's released from your gut when you're hungry. And the gut is empty, which releases ghrelin that tells the brain that uh, you need to fill up. Uh, and ghrelin as well interacts with the reward processes in the brain. And um, that one, we did some research on that. Um, in our hands, at least, the effect was very mild, very minor, on drug seeking. And, but there are other groups that try to work with ghrelin and uh, so that interaction between those systems that are um, important for energy balance, uh, weight control, feeding control and, uh, and general reward, uh, that's actually an interaction that makes sense. Uh, we don't know enough about it. So um, there, are, there are now groups that look more carefully into that. I kind of since then drifted into other directions. But it was an interesting experience, definitely. Well the, the hormone ghrelin or the, the secretion of ghrelin isn't something that I remember vividly, but I, what I do remember as an analogy of like the um, uh, leptin ghrelin paradox is obviously in the pancreas when you have insulin and glucagon, right? And you know leptin deals with fat, insulin glucagon the uh, insulin glucagon they work with sugar, or glucose, uh, uh, starch, for right. example, in, in the body. And, and each one of those uh, hormones <coughs> deals with uh, different macromolecules differently. Um, for the viewers, I just want to show this this very funny image. And it's a classic image. We see this in every psychology or biology book. The comparison between uh, the two mice. I'm just going to pull this off here. So, so you can see like the fat mouse. I think it's on the right-hand side. And the skinnier mouse on the on the left, 
pretty sure it's in verse for you guys, but anyway. So it, there is a stark difference between <laughs> both of these mice here. And um, so I'm guessing you really saw this in the lab back when you were working with the Well, we were not aiming for those very uh, dramatic differences. We wanted to play uh, with what, as close as possible to uh, physiological, physiologically relevant, maybe concentrations. Uh, so our um, manipulations were not uh, aimed at kind of creating those uh, kind of very <laughs> dramatic images. We just wanted to affect the behavior. So uh, uh, we used uh, very, very uh, low levels, very low doses uh, of both the and leptin. Uh, trying to get to the lowest possible dose that would still affect behavior uh, for the child. So no, we did not see those very <laughs> yeah, <I> mean, <laughs> impressive <laughs> images. It's, it's not like when you put, like, let's say, in, in, in chemistry, I remember back in high school, uh, the, the professor had sodium. I don't know how he had access to sodium, but if you drop the, um, the sodium, which is the Na+, plus, and you, when you dissociate it from the chlorine, which is Cl-, minus, you drop that sodium in water, it causes like a massive explosion. Yeah, and he would do that. Thing. With that. Right. Lots of teachers got <laughs> harmed by that. So, and he would do that like back in high school. So it wasn't as obvious as seeing such a reaction. So I'm glad that. No, no, it's yeah. not. We are not aiming for that sledgehammer approach. Right. Uh, we really, in almost everything that we do, we are aiming for the lowest possible uh, doses. Um, we, do, we use a range, of course, because we do want to mature the kids in something, but the, uh, the bottom line is that we are trying to get to the lowest effective functional dose, so not kind of create those, uh, it looks very nice or very impressive, I don't know if nice, but very impressive, but that's not our, uh, that's not our goal, and, and it's not really relevant to, what, to the questions that we are asking when we go back. Generally, when you go back to research, uh, you start with a question, mystery, a uh, question that you want to answer. The hypothesis. And, and then you create on, yeah, uh, through that research question, uh, you create a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis and uh, you're trying to use the approaches that will be as subtle as possible, um, otherwise you will get many kind of side effects or unwanted uh, outcomes, but that's not the idea. And I, I did hear you uh, make the bridge between studying the bio biology of leptin and you did nicely branch into the psychology aspect which mm -hmm. uh, deals with reward systems. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate on reward systems, how they function, how that parallels with the human being? For sure? Yeah, that's kind of the, the, a very exciting side of what, what we do. Uh, as I said, yeah, we're very interested in the underlying biology or the, uh, the neuroscience. But there's the psychological side and uh, uh, all kinds of psychological processes. Uh, reward processing is, is one of those. Um, enforcement, for example, is a, it's a psychological term. Uh, and um, there has been um, really huge effort over the years to identify what drives us as uh, humans or Actually, not just us. Uh, all almost all animals are driven by uh, we call it motivation. So there's this energy that drives us to do something. And in many cases, that uh, motivation, that energy, is uh, modulated or is triggered by uh, rewarding stimuli. Uh, so that, that that seems like a really uh, interesting goal to, to look into, an interesting process to look into, and there are several pathways that have been identified and are thought to be critical for the reward processing, so when you are exposed to a stimulus, your senses kind of identify and kind of bring that information into the brain, and then the brain has to decide, is it good for me, is it bad for me, would I want it again or not, uh, do I like it? Yes, uh, so liking is, is one of the uh, processes that uh, are related to, to reward, of course. Uh, not the only one, but one of them. And 
Well, I think one system that uh, almost everyone knows is the dopamine. It's kind of the, the, the uh, good PR. Yeah. Uh, so the dopaminergic system is thought to be critical for our reward processing. And in very rough terms, when you are exposed to a stimulus, that, uh, to an event or a stimulus that uh, is uh, perceived as rewarding, that the reason is that it's perceived as rewarding because there is this release of reward, dopamine. An expectation, kind of? Or? It's not expectation, it's a response to, to the exposure to that uh, stimulus. So that could be uh, even you know, sugar to, to a baby. Uh, no kind of no uh, teaching, no uh, uh, training is involved. It's kind of an innate response you give to uh, something sweet. There will probably be a release of, of dopamine, and that is true also for other uh, stimuli and events. Uh, um, sex, for example, is also caused uh, release of dopamine. Now, uh, dopamine, that's not the only thing that it does. I mean, you mentioned expectation, so dopamine is probably also involved in expectation. And expectation is another aspect, maybe, of reward, but not only. You can also expect that thing to happen. Uh, and uh, dopamine is probably involved in that as well. So it's a more sophisticated system than just, okay, you have dopamine, you have reward. It's not as simple. Now we know that it's not as straightforward. There was a time, and actually it was a professor from Concordia, Roy Wise, that uh, was extremely influ influential still in the field. Um, and uh, he worked in Concordia in the 80s, uh, early 80s, and uh, he came up with this concept that uh, reward is dopamine, or mm -hmm. dopamine is reward. So everything you call it the yumminess yeah. of a stimulus, yeah. that's dopamine. When dopamine is released, that's reward. Right. That's the, the, the yumminess of the, uh, of the stimulus. Over time, it <laughs> turned out that it's more sophisticated than that, but it was extremely influential. Still is. Uh, in some aspects, because uh, some uh, of the concepts still hold uh, to this day, but it was adjusted, uh, added to uh, over the years. But uh, it's a nice, I guess, relation with Concordia that this actually started here uh, in Montreal. It was the first place that actually invested. Then in. he came up with uh, that concept. Now, dopamine. Researched on uh, in several places, but the, this concept of dopamine equals reward came from Roy Wise uh, from Concordia. So, who was the professor that was conducting that research? Roy Wise. Roy Wise. Mm -hmm. Roy, Dr. Roy Wise. Okay. Roy Wise. Yeah. Roy Wise. No, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, he worked here in the early eighties. Him and another really influential person, James Stewart. Um, that she's still here in Montreal. Roy Wise. Uh, moved to the States, to the NIH, National Institute of Health, uh, in the United States. Uh, but uh, James Stewart continued in the Department of Psychology in the CSD, and actually uh, Brian. Um, uh, really, uh, for many, many years, uh, she, until she retired, and she's still involved. So uh, yeah, the Concordia and, and uh, Concordia University and Montreal in general are considered a really powerhouse for uh, neuroscience research. So uh, it's kind of nice to be involved. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, and another, you know, we're talking about hormones and, and um, research well, when it comes to neuroscience and basically just, you know, the human systems. Um, I think a lot of as well about, um, I, think, I think as well about the, 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 the doping centers. Like the in, in for athletes like steroids and that kind of thing, like Montreal was one of those pioneers and then those yeah. powerhouses when it came to uh, investigating athletes or not just athletes but uh, to under investigate the effects of steroids um, on performance and other performance enhancing drugs, right? So uh, I'm glad to say that Montreal is actually uh, on the map in that respect, you know. And, and you can add to that, uh, you know, Dr. Penfield. I'm not sure if he's from Montreal, but he's Canadian. Dr. Penfield worked a lot uh, on the brain. Yeah, and, and, and I is also considered like the Montreal uh, 
neurological is considered also uh, one of the leading uh, in brain research, basic more human research in that case. Right. Um, so yeah, I think we could actually segue into you know uh, the particular reward systems and and motivation because right now I'm taking a course with uh, Harvard University online. So it's an education course, or more precisely, a higher education course where we look at student motivation and um, you know these all these different notions of metacognition, grit, motivation, and um, learning patterns. Right, and I'm pretty sure you, you obviously you taught at Concordia. You, you had a plethora of students. Still teaching. Yeah. You're still teaching at Concordia. Um, and, and doing research. And doing I research. Not retired. Well, <laughs> well, that's that's great. We're still having you, and we're going to make sure that we keep you as long as we can. Um, so right now, I'm really looking at uh, looking at the psychology of students. You know, having had a plethora of different students, I'm pretty sure you can you know nitpick and distinguish like the different student tendencies. And as an educator, um, what are the most stark things that you notice in student patterns like on the psychological level? I'm not sure what is it that you're aiming for. I mean, students over the generations, there, there are changes. Some of them, I think, are driven just by culture. Uh, some of them are driven by societal changes and needs. Uh, some of them are driven by dramatic <laughs> Traumatic events like COVID and nineteen right. has yeah. huge impact on students. So I'm not sure what is it that uh, you mean by the psychology of this of the students. Uh, well, I mean, like if I try to put myself in the lecturer's shoes and having given a, a few talks here and there, uh, I notice that sometimes just the body language, the the stage presence, or not the stage presence, sorry, uh, the in the audience, you can you can tell that the body language or facial expressions. Of the students do communicate how effectively they're receiving the information that's being lectured or delivered to them and um, I try to focus a lot on whether or not students are absorbing the material effectively right so so I'm thinking okay well um, what what patterns like what we're going to talk about reward systems grit and motivation like what patterns could uh, fortify or, or um, enhance student comprehension when it comes to you know delivering teaching material or delivering uh, the, the course content, you know, as a professor. Yeah, well, that's not um, that's definitely not one of my areas of expertise. Uh, I teach, uh, try to make my classes as interesting as possible, and I try to do that because I'm passionate about what I'm teaching. So uh, the classes that I'm teaching. Uh, at the moment are those that are related to neurobiology or to drug abuse uh, and this is something that I, I feel very uh, connected to so I try to convey that passion to, to the students and I think in most cases they appreciate that um, that's um, I hope I'll keep them interested in a way I guess I'm lucky people are those that get to my class are those that are have an interest in neuroscience and also have an interest in uh, in drugs. That I guess that the lucky side of it that drugs are somehow drugs of abuse are still an interesting topic. Absolutely. Yeah. So that makes it a bit easier. Um, but uh, other than that, I, yeah, I don't have a really um, I guess coherent answer to that question. It's, it's, again, it's not something that I think too much about other than how do I, uh, at the basic level, how do I make the material interesting for the students, but beyond that, uh, it's not that I'm developing unique teaching uh, experiences or, or teaching environments. Uh, and so that's uh, sure. definitely not one of my, my expertise, um, for better or worse. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, it's, it's totally fine because, like, from a student perspective, you know, having been, I, I've been a student at Concordia since 2014, but then there was like a two or three year gap where I went to McGill and then came back here for different studies. And what I did notice oftentimes with, from the student uh, perspective is uh, just by talking to some students, like, some students, they tell me about like using amphetamines and different you know, types, of, types of performance enhancing drugs, but for. 
for in, in the school sector, right? And then uh, for, for school purposes or for um, uh, educational performance and uh, or academic performance rather. And you know, that fascinated me because I'm so far away from all that. And, uh, and sometimes I'd ask him questions like, okay, well, when exactly do you take these methamphetamines? And like, why are you taking them? Are they super, are they that necessary? And a lot of them take them for, to study harder, to just as like, you know, as steroids for the brain, right? So. Yeah, um, this is something that has been going on for many years. But I felt so, I felt so naive because I was so far away from all that stuff. Yeah, so, so yeah, you've been, <laughs> I guess, somehow <laughs> insulated from that. Uh, yeah, that has something that, you know, has been going on for many years. There are lots of studies about the prevalence of uh, uh, those types of drugs are called psychostimulants. So use of psychostimulants in, uh, in uh, students' populations is, is actually quite common, unfortunately. Um, in most cases, it's yeah, it's an abuse. It would not lead to um, extreme uh, extreme states like um, addiction or uh, drug use disorder. It's a, it's a phase, and most people, most students will phase out of it. It's the right. same with alcohol. Uh, it's less here, less common here in, in Canada, maybe because drinking um, age is not as restricted as in, the, as in the United States. The moment that students go to colleges away from their parents, I guess, um, they binge. Uh, and that happens in, in Canada as well. But Extent. But they phase out of it. Most of them, of course, there's always a risk of that percentage, uh, the proportion that would actually get hit. Uh, and the same goes for the psychostimulants. People use it as enhancers, as kind of you know, study enhancers because it helps you focus. Right. It brings you know, it brings your energy levels up, uh, which is helpful. But most most would phase out of it. Of course, there are the risks that are involved with uh, the use of psychostimulants, uh, health risks that are many. Uh, but that's something that has been going on. Uh, that, uh, there's a whole market of, uh, uh, of supplying uh, those uh, stimulants to, to students. Um, most of them are not for even fun, just really as a study. Study help. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't know how you missed it, but <laughs> I don't know I was probably protected from it, or like it. Yeah. It was. It never really dawned on me to take amphetamines or, or other stimulants to perform well in school. Like I was performing okay. I was a good student. I wasn't very good. I was, you know, passing my courses and doing doing well, performing well, doing good. I remember uh, some of my favorite courses actually. Now that we're talking about um, you know students and, and stimulants and that kind of thing were uh, psychology courses that I took in my first year. I remember taking, uh, I took uh, Drugs and Behavior with Dr. Joseph Del Tempo. Oh you know, yeah. You probably know. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago, uh, winter 2014. And I remember also taking uh, Psychology and the Law with Jack Hirschberg. Mm -hmm. Not sure if he's still around here. Mm -hmm. uh, Hirschberg, I think, sorry. Yeah, those are what we call uh, LTAs. So those are people that are coming just to teach. Right. Which don't have labs, so they're not uh, full-time faculty in Concordia. Many of them have uh, clinical degrees, uh, they have their own uh, clinic, uh, and they teach uh, when they can. So, so yeah, so for Del Temple's course, um, you know, it was quite obvious for me to make that selection because I had just started biochemistry and I wanted to know the yeah you know, I wanted to know the connection between the biochemistry side or the biochemical aspects of drugs as well as the psychological ramifications that they may have and it was a very nice course because we went through a myriad of different um, drugs or so-called drugs like uh, like marijuana alcohol we even delved it's into still a drug so, so <laughs> yeah alcohol is definitely a drug even though it, and my and, and yeah and cannabis is still a drug even right. though it's legalized. Yeah, yeah. got legalized as caffeine, as nicotine. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm very guilty 
for caffeine. I mean, I drink coffee on a regular basis, but caffeine in and in of itself, it's, uh, it does have its psychotropic elements into it. So, and we had the choice whether, you know, I could, um, I could take three exams or I could take two exams and give a presentation and do my little research on, on one particular drug. I was like, I'm gonna give a, I'm, I'm, I wanna give a presentation. Like, it, it sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, I chose cocaine. So I, I looked at cocaine, I looked at the, you know, the pop stars that use uh, cocaine, I looked at the different effects um, and like how, how potent, how addictive it is and, and that kind of thing. And I remember, like, I still remember to this day because that was one of my best presentations ever because I, I really, I got passionate about learning more about cocaine. And given the fact that, you know, in the 80s, there was a crack epidemic, the difference between pure cocaine and crack cocaine and that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, I might, I think you know, I heard you mention heroin, or was there, what, what were, what are the kind of drugs that you worked on in your research? Uh, the major one were, uh, are still uh, heroin and cocaine, the last, yes, yeah, definitely. I'm working with heroin and rarely with cocaine, uh, although I uh, do some studies with cocaine as well. Those are two types of uh, uh, of substances, uh, one of them, the heroin belongs to, to the opiates, so opioids, opioid drugs, and uh, cocaine belongs to psychostimulants. Uh, so, heroin would be uh, put together with oxycodone, oxycontin, uh, morphine, uh, and uh, fentanyl. And more recently, cocaine is the uh, family of amphetamines, uh, methamphetamine, uh, so on. Uh, and they have different uh, different targets in the brain. The impact is very different uh, on our psyche, I guess, on, and on our behavior. Uh, so as psychostimulants, <laughs> as the name implies, they stimulate us. Uh, opiates, uh, first of all, are um, well, they uh, reduce pain, which is one of their benefits, uh, their great benefits. Uh, they are very, very effective in doing that. Um, but they also cause this euphoric uh, effect. And they are, what we call, I guess, downers in a way. So they do not stimulate as much as uh, psychostimulants. Um, so because their effects are different and because the underlying brain mechanism are different, we're trying when we are studying a particular behavior, we're trying to see the effects of both types of drugs because uh, that tells us more about how generalized, if we come up with an idea about a, uh, about a pathway, about a mechanism in the brain that uh, underlies a behavior, we would want to see how generalizable is this. Uh, potential mechanism if it does cover any type of behavior, any type of uh, drug or, or stimulus so that works for heroin, for cocaine, what drives the behavior under any condition. Food, that's another thing we will often test as well, is the effect that we see also generalized with food reward. Um, so um, another Drugs that uh, work a little bit is nicotine, uh, which is very, very common, illegal <laughs> for many years. Uh, so that's another type, well, it kind of belongs, I guess, to the psychostimulant because it has this stimulating uh, effect. Uh, a type of substance that I haven't worked for, uh, haven't worked with at all is hallucinogens. Uh, Acid. Uh, acid, yeah, yeah LSD acid. Uh, those are drugs that, uh, strangely enough, animals do not appreciate <laughs> much. It's, uh, I mean, heroin and cocaine don't really take, even it's relatively easy to train them to take. It's like training them, almost like training them with food and uh, daily life. Uh, but uh, they do not appreciate hallucinogens very much. It's very difficult to get them to take drugs, uh, to take hallucinogens uh, voluntarily. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, 
what is it about it that humans find uh, so attractive? Even though there, there's a very minor uh, risk of addiction even uh, in terms of these very, very rare can be defined as addiction, uh, unlike uh, opiates and uh, psychostimulants. Um, that does not, only does not happen with the hallucination. And maybe that's the reason that animals are not really interested in that experience. They don't like that experience. Uh, so that whatever they're feeling, we do not know. But whatever they're experiencing, they don't like it. And, uh, I was going to ask, like, how exactly did they react? Because, I mean, if human beings um, find pleasure in, in those types of drugs like LSD and DMA, um, but uh, on the other hand, animals actually find displeasure or discomfort. So I'm wondering, okay, well, where's the disconnect? Where is, like, or maybe because I, I would, you know, just as you were talking, I was thinking about a few things, and I was thinking, okay, well, if the animal doesn't like ecstasy, for example, but the human being likes it. Is it because there is an intellectual stimulus in the human being, like a seeing different things that you wouldn't see when you're sober, that kind of thing, like in a dreamlike state? Is maybe maybe the intellectual sentience of the human being, uh, given that it's higher than that of animals, perhaps animals can't reflect and intellectually make something out of the experience? It could be that, well, even for humans, Particularly in the first exposure, uh, they do not perceive that as very pleasant. Sometimes it's scary. Uh, it's a loss of control in a way, so it depends on all sorts of implications in many cases. And so it could be that animals just perceive that as an aversive event uh, that, that cannot make sense of their environment. We do have no idea what the animals are thinking, and this is a risk that yeah, we need to be aware of. We tend to reflect on the animals what we feel in many cases, uh, but even the term pleasure that we use apply to the animals now, and they're taking heroin because of the pleasure that they feel, it's an interpretation of their behavior. Right. All we see is that they make an effort, sometimes really great efforts, to get the heroin again, once uh, they are well trained. Um, and we interpret that as they do that, because probably they feel that it is good for them, or they feel good about it, or they feel pleasure, but that's our interpretation, we have no idea what they actually feel. So with hallucinogens, it's even more extreme, uh, the experience of hallucinogens is could be uh, much more uh, involved, much more uh, sophisticated, you could say. So animals might interpret that as a, as a bit aversive. And, uh, so they would make no effort to do that again. Uh, there are limitations to the animal models, and we are very aware of that. Uh, we are even not trying to say that animals when we do train them with an addictive substance like heroin, we try to avoid saying that animals are addicted. And addiction, the human has a definition. Right. And with animals, it's sometimes difficult to apply that definition. We can look at aspects of addiction that, that we can do. Uh, we definitely can uh, recreate those aspects in animals. Be very careful about calling them addictive animals. Uh, they show some aspects of addiction, definitely. I, I do agree that um, you know, oftentimes, especially in, in the scientific realm, humans may tend to anthropomorphize, yeah. and just to have an anthropomorphic approach to uh, other species' digestion or or experience of different. Um, the, you know, different experiences or different, uh, let's say, drugs in this situation, and um, we think, you know, as human beings, who might, you know, impose the 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 human reality, the human perspective of things on on different uh, beings. And as you're mentioning, like if there are 
stark differences between a human's reaction to a particular drug and an animal's reaction to one drug. And on the flip side, if they have similar reactions to, let's say, heroin and cocaine, then that begs the question, well, okay, since one is a stimulant and the other is not, um, perhaps the very nature of the drug that's being consumed may be um, the culprit in this situation for, for that type of difference. Well, of course, as I've said, the different types of, of drugs have also uh, different targets. Yeah, there is a common pathway in the end. Probably <laughs> dopamine is involved in that strongly, perhaps. So not the only thing, but uh, the uh, targets, the direct uh, targets of in the brain for those uh, different drugs are different. And their effect on the brain are different. So long term exposure has different, uh, would result in different outcomes in the brain. The brain changes when it is exposed to, to drugs. Um, that's why they said that even one exposure to cocaine changes the brain. Yeah, that's that's why long I, term. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I uh, what I found when I went well, eight years ago when I or nine uh, nine years ago now when I presented on on cocaine. Like, okay, one exposure yeah. can be so dramatic. Yeah, it kind of it changes the brain, it changes um, activity or interactions in the brain for a relatively long time, even if it's a single exposure. It can be reversed, but it takes time. Uh, and long-term exposure could change the brain maybe for a lifetime. So the different drugs have different effects on the brain. I mean, physically, the, the brain changes uh, in a different uh, way uh, if it's exposed to uh, heroin, exposed to cocaine, and even to MDMA or to ecstasy. That has an effect on the brain. Uh, it's not considered as dramatic as the effect of psychostimulants and opiates, but <clears throat> there, I mean, even though people consider ecstasy and MDMA, pure MDMA, uh, as a relatively safe drug, it changes the brain. We're not sure what it means, <laughs> but it does change the brain a bit, um, and in a different way than cocaine and, and heroin. So, uh, just for general information, your brain will change if you continuously or repeatedly exposed to MDMA. If it's a bad thing or a good or a good thing, that's an open question, but uh, it changes, uh, the brain changes. I, I would be tempted to think that in the short term it might be good because a lot of artists or um, <laughs> high status people may use or have known to you, have been known, sorry, to use like uh, MDMA or other uh, types of drugs for their performance or their creativity and um, like you can draw an analogy with uh, the dreamlike state, uh, the, the effects or benefits of dreams, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of are, as an experience, dreams can somewhat be similar to drug experiences, but at a lower level, no, not really, but I mean, just the fact that we're exiting a reality you know, as a common denominator. And I think about, uh, you know, just back in my, in my bachelor's degree, like Dimitri Mendelia, the, the periodic table, Right, that was discovered in a dream. Uh, there were a couple of songs. I think the Beatles, one of the Beatles songs, was written in a dream. Well, not written, but like thought about in a dream. Um, so, you know, when it comes to MDMA and LSD and, and those those types of uh, no, not uh, non-stimulant drugs, um, you did mention that there there are changes to the, to the brain. But are there are, are they also structural or more functional? No, uh, there are structural changes, and this is what. Uh, people are looking for right uh, those changes have been identified with psychostimulants in some cases we are talking about the uh, neurotoxicity so uh, neurons die with uh, prolonged exposure to psychostimulants or over exposure to uh, psychostimulants uh, heroin is safer in that respect uh, even though it does uh, change the brain but it's considered to be safer and methamphetamine is really So MDMA and the relative, the, and definitely LSD uh, uh, acid are considered safer uh, in that respect. They do change the structure uh, in a particular system, the serotonergic system, where you see that some cells disappear or are inhibited. Uh, again, it's not entirely clear what it means because 
there hasn't been any particular deficit that has been identified as coming up as a, as a big problem. There are memory issues at some point, uh, but you need to have those very sensitive tests to identify those deficits. It's not something very obvious. Um, so, as I said, the brain changes, but we're not sure what it means. Um, the experience itself of being under the influence could be, uh, for some people, would be very exciting and, and productive, and for some it could be quite scary. Uh, but that's related to the, I guess, the psychological experience. Uh, that's a bit different. Um, so, this. Uh, Artists <laughs> have been known to use substances for centuries. Oh, yeah. And, uh, absinthe was very popular uh, at the time. It appears also in many of those classic impressions. Uh, pictures. It's green substance in a glass. That's absinthe. <coughs> Which for a time I think was outlawed in North America. I don't know if it still is, but it was outlawed. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm pretty much. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. I mean, yeah, I'm going yeah. to have to look into it because I'm not too familiar. I've heard of yeah, it's, absinthe. it's back, I think. Uh, absinthe is back. I don't know if they changed the, the, the content, but the woodworm uh, is a critical factor in it. So, um, maybe that's a free bar. And that's uh, the, the critical factor. So anyway, yeah, uh, that experience apparently is uh, very helpful to some uh, artists to become more, I don't know, productive. <laughs> that they, I mean, a lot of them do perform better when when they are under the influence of drugs, but then again, like... Or worse. I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, if you, everybody, Eric Clapton, I think, during that time. Eric Clapton? Eric Clapton, when he snapped out of heroin years or for many years, he said that definitely his playing suffered when he, when he was hooked on heroin. There was no argument that he became a much worse uh, guitarist when he used heroin. Uh, so it could go both ways. Um, but I guess we are talking about something else. We're talking about uh, releasing the mind, uh, so losing control and letting the mind do its stuff, which hallucinogen would probably do very well. And that could really, really help with the creative process, I assume. Uh, so, there are some, I'm sure there are artists that are uh, being helped with new types. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, since you're in the Department of Theology, then, uh, those mind-altering drugs have been used extensively. In religious, uh, right. in religious uh, um, I was actually going to navigate toward there and to, to actually explore that the different religions have different religious experiences thanks to the usage of drugs and um, and I'm again I'm, I'm on the fence this one when, when it comes to that like a, I mean is, is it favorable or unfavorable to do so like a, um, you know does that tamper with the connecting with God or the divine or, um, so, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, I, I would definitely uh, talk about with theologians or just folks that are into philosophy and to understand, like, the, but obviously the psychological elements are important because, um, let's say, if there are, I don't know, stories in the Bible, right, that may have uh, different characters use uh, particular substances to, to encounter the divine or whatever, well, Obviously, they're going to behave in a certain way. That's going to tamper. That's going to affect their behavior. Right? Well, for their experience, uh, that would then change their behavior for generations. I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess there's this. First of all, there's this personal experience. I guess that people would uh, interpret their experience as a, a religious experience, uh, a divine. <clears throat> but there is also, I guess, from people that uh, you know, the 
shamans have been known to use those words and they kind of convey uh, the words of the divine or the, more, uh, the wants of the divine. And that appears, I guess, in many, many cultures, uh, both indigenous and uh, others. Um, so that seems to be a very useful tool for uh, interaction with, uh, you know, with the higher forces. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I read somewhere that alcohol might have been used at first just to uh, help with that kind of uh, uh, direct interaction. Sometimes I guess we became more humans, we became more Puritans and uh, <laughs> started avoiding this experience of complete loss of control and opening up to a different experience that, uh, um, that, that I'm not sure about those processes and you might know more about that, how that kind of religion then started to kind of clamp down on those experiences and look at them as a uh, negative, that you should avoid, that it implies weakness of character, immorality. Uh, I'm not sure when that happened and why. Uh, maybe the control. I could speculate that. I think the, the pendulum kind of swinged back and forth between a more Puritan mindset versus uh, an openness mindset where what it I feel like in history, uh, there have been, you know, these uh, different phases back and forth, back and forth, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, permitting drugs or permitting uh, substances that may inebriate or just tamper with people's sobriety. Like I can think of, I was reading a book uh, about uh, the prohibition in, in the United States. Like prior to the prohibition alcohol was open for use, right, and open for consumption. Then you had the prohibition phase where alcohol was kind of banned, or was banned. And then after the prohibition, the, the ban got lifted, and then people started drinking again, right? So I think it's a, a kind of a same, the same thing with drugs, where you have these different phases and times, like spent just looking at the 20th century. You look at the Les Années Folles, right, the, the, the crazy years of the 20s, the crazy 20s, uh, after the First World War, like, Folks were, folks were crazy. They, they were, it was, uh, you know, quite the debauchery for that particular epoch. And then, obviously, you had, like, the 50s, the, the 40s and 50s, folks got more conservative. But then, boom, you have the 60s and 70s and 80s where you have, like, the, you know, the, the peace and love hippie movement. And I was just watching a movie the other day, The Jesus Revolution, to kind of link the uses of drugs and then, you know, the religious movements in the United States and how, you know, a bunch of hippies started you know, reverting back to, to the faith, the, to the Christian faith in, in the United States, starting in California and down south. And, but now, like, fast forward to 2023, like, I can't help but ask, like, what's going on in Canada, especially in BC and in Alberta with the fentanyl epidemic? You know, we've got to come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, which definitely reduced my leptin because I ate a lot. So, <laughs> so a lot of increased your leptin. Increased, 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 sorry. Increased Unfortunately, product. increased your right. leptin. Right. <laughs> Uh, so I'm still working on that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like in Canada, like the, 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 the heroin epidemic in BC, and now the fentanyl uh, usage is so white, it's getting more and more widespread. And that, that's, uh, that's right. Yeah, uh, it is an epidemic. Um, the numbers of uh, overdose deaths are really scary. It spreads, but in BC, it's, it's just I mean, literally the walk and the pick up bodies from, from the carriers. Um, like people would pass out in the back end? No, they, they died. They died. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you're talking about uh, in, in the first four months of this year. It's crazy, uh, and um, the uh, the reason is uh, it's much more complicated than than just uh, okay. Uh, people are looking for 
substance to that one. Uh, and it's much more involved than that. It's different. There is a, yeah, I mean, it, it's more involved than that. that uh, I mean, the number of homeless people also increases mm -hmm. dramatically. That could be also be linked to that. Uh, could, it's like the, the chicken and the egg, what came, comes first. Right. Uh, but they definitely feed uh, each other. So I'm not even going to try to understand what drives it. From a biological point of view, once fentanyl got into the market, that changed things because of how potent it is. Mm -hmm. And it's so potent, it started to be uh, tapped into other drugs as well to make them more to make them feel more positive. So when you think of unrelated drugs, like even MDMA, uh, and certainly heroin, so you need to be very careful because that could kill you. Uh, and uh, because of the intense euphoric effect it has, it's, it's probably more addictive. It creates the habit maybe quicker and stronger. But as to the societal, psychological reasons why the, it just doesn't stop, I'm not going to even try, and I don't know how you deal with that. Yeah, yeah. There is this harm reduction approach, which is different. You do not solve the addiction problem whatsoever. But uh, in countries like Portugal, that seem to be very successful. They just allow small amounts of any kind of drug that you are using. Mm -hmm. They allow it, it's uh, fine if they find you with it. Uh, though you can, I think it's like 10 days worth or something like that, that they allow to carry you around. Uh, if they find you with it, they'll offer you services, support services, they'll offer you three meals and so on. So the drugs can be tested. They Clean drugs and so on. <clears throat> You're not afraid. You don't have to buy them uh, in uh, untrusted areas, uh, and that reduced the number of uh, overdose deaths. I think close to ninety percent, which, which is unheard of in Portugal. It's, in Portugal, it's extremely successful. Uh, of course, if you are a supplier, if you're you deal with drugs, yeah, you're still, that's still illegal. It's not that they legalized every drug use, but for the users, that made, th made things much uh, safer. But that reduced the overdose. So right now, BC, I hear, are trying to do it. They're trying to convince the federal government to allow them to do something similar. Uh, is that hopeful? It would not resolve the issue of the use. But it might reduce the number of deaths. Uh, now, those users, some of them are intelligent people, so they know that the risk is in this, they know uh, what's involved, uh, and they would still do that. Uh, that's the power uh, the drugs uh, would have on you. Uh, and again, it's a much more complicated. Solution than just okay, let's cut the drugs and see what happens. That uh, almost never helps. Uh, it never, almost never helps. Everything just goes under the table until they get money. But um, yeah, we'll see what happens in BC. That, that approach, I think, at least uh, uh, reduces the number of uh, those deaths. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, because in Canada, we do have these sort of clinics for safe injections, quote unquote. Like, uh, but that, then again, like how effective these clinics are. A lot of people would say that they're just a catastrophic and utter failure because of how people are, are still, it's not solving the problem. It's not even helping. Right? Yeah, but so. it depends what you're aiming for. People, there are those approaches that suggest that the way to deal with the uh, the drug problem is to educate it head on, uh, find the sources, limit the drug, uh, prohibit any drug using, uh, offer treatment to the user. 
Uh, that hasn't been successful. They've tried it for decades. That's not working. But still, people are pretty keen on it. I guess, particularly for more conservative, uh, for more conservative uh, societies, that's uh, that's the approach. Uh, if the immediate goal is just to reduce harm, to prevent people from dying. And those clinics are, or those safe injection uh, areas are actually quite successful. They, every day that they say they save people. Um, like I said, that fentanyl tapping is the most dangerous part of it. People, users, long-term users know exactly how much they need to take, but they have no idea how, what's in the pill. So if they think that they're taking heroin and they are uh, dosing according to that, and it's fentanyl, or there is a considerable uh, component of fentanyl, they'll die, or they'll overdose. And if there's no one, else, no one around to treat them, they'll die. Those safe injection places, every day, they kind of inject naloxone, the, the antidote, the antagonist, uh, every day, they do it several times. So in that respect, you could say they just saved, like, I don't know, five people today, that's not successful, isn't successful, but I guess it depends on how you measure it. The person that injected safely, in a safe place with a clean needle, without having to share the needle, without having to be afraid that someone will snatch it, uh, um, that person would not stop you from coming <laughs> either the next day or even the same day to do it again. So it, it's not fixing the, that problem, but those people are alive. And so I, I assume that when you say those are not successful, it depends on how you define it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So because like, yeah, the, the thing is, um, it would, people have different standards of success or different perspective of how we can successfully tackle the, the drug issue. Well, then again, yeah, I mean, saving five people, as you mentioned, you know, is a form of success. Like, I, saving five people is better than saving no one. And it's not, again, I mean, it's not trivial. No one wants a safe <laughs> injection place in their backyard because, yeah, it draws in that kind of population. So there will be problems, there will be kind of garbage, there will be trash sometimes violence outside. Uh, no one wants that in their neighborhood. No. Unfortunately, that's how it works. Uh, I don't know what the, the solution is. Uh, you want those safe houses or safe places in an area where you find the users. And unfortunately, that would be downtown, that would be in areas where you don't want that kind of population littering around and kind of waiting in line and as I said there has been notifications and there's definitely trash and uh, garbage and all that and that is left. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly where uh, what the, the, the best solution is but the bottom line is that when there is such a place it saves lives. And I mean, there are a lot of stakeholders involved as well. Like, I mean, doctors are going to have their perspective on it. And I mean, the onus is on them to, or not on them, but actually on the government to help them, uh, you know, provide safe, respectable clinics for these types of people to, to show up. And again, it goes back to grit and motivation that we were talking about earlier, to have that motivation to get out of that drug usage pattern, right? And, and that harmful cascade of, of uh, um, re reoccurring events. Right? Yeah, that, that's. Kind of the, the next step is how do you uh, actually apply an, an approach that would help in diverting people out of that cycle? Um, that's uh, one, one of the more successful approaches actually is uh, replacement therapy. So instead of heroin or fentanyl or whatever, it's uh, one of the major ones. An opioid replacement. I heard of it. Yeah. It's a very old way to do that. What happens is that it's 
uh, eliminates the withhold symptom tachypronophia. It does not have the same euphoric effect, but it allows you to, con to go back in to the function. One of the problems with, uh, with addicts, particularly heroin addicts, is that they need to get their fix. And when there are heavy users, that would be more than once a day, or maybe two, three, four times a day. That's, first of all, a lot of time that you spend on getting the drug, it's a lot of money. Right. Uh, at some point, even though heroin now is very cheap. Uh, but um, you spend most of your time trying to get a drug, get injected, you spend half your day either half dead or uh, totally zoned out, and then another cycle, and another cycle. So one of the things that, that replacement therapy allows you is to snap out of that because you don't really need that desperately uh, to take the drug. And if there is a support system that would also, because that's the, not the major reason, treating withdrawal uh, is relatively easy. The problem is that people don't want to stop, but once you can get people into functioning level, mm -hmm. you can then maybe work with them about, okay, what can we do in order to Resolve your problem. You don't want to get back to the street, right? You right. want to get a job. You want a place, maybe a family. You know. So that's a, that allows you to do that, and it has been actually the most successful treatment is with replacement, long term. Short term, you have all kinds of trials, things that would hold six months, maybe a year, but over I don't know, you look over five years, then eighty-five percent, eighty eighty-five percent of people who quit. Wow, well, that's a large number. Yeah, I mean, there are studies in literature that shows how scary, and it doesn't change. I always show in class two figures, one from the 70s and one from the 2000s, high for some reason, it's 10. Yeah. Yeah. It shows you how many people actually stayed sober or stayed abstinent with cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and you know, those curves look the same. And they, you can think the first two, three months, six months, it looks very nice. Uh, um, 80% success, but then it drops. And roughly 15 would stay absent long term, and even then, lapse or might relapse. So there's yeah. another percentage of that 15. That they could be. actually, after many many, we hear about uh, movie stars mostly or uh, celebrities that after I don't know, 15 years or 20 years of abstinence somehow relapse and die. Of overdose because they do not recognize the, the proper dosing and so on. Uh, so that's a very effective way to try and maintain uh, at least controllable. They don't stop using drugs completely. They do take heroin every once in a while, but not at the same desperate need. They take it because they have to. They might need a divine intervention to. <laughs> they need some them. intervention. <laughs> to to quickly, and if something becomes really valuable, well, that's another thing we didn't touch upon. But there's a there's this professor in Harvard, um, Jim or something, uh, and he came up with the uh, concept that uh, addiction is actually a, a disease of, of choice. And uh, I can send you the, uh, he wrote a couple of books, I can send you the book on that. And uh, he suggests that it's a, uh, it's a disease of, a disorder of choice. Because right. when you look at the stats, you see that many people use in their 20s. At the 30s, there is this sharp decrease, kind of this drop in, uh, in drug use. Right, I think it's G uh, Gene M. Heyman. Heyman, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's this sharp drop, and he said, nothing changed other than goals in life. Oh, I see. People okay. just now have a maybe family, they want to uh, keep at the work, so they just stop. And so they change from really avid users, heavy users, to non users <laughs> within a very short period of time. So he said that too much is made over the, kind of the power of the drugs to diabetes. 
behavior and actually it's a choice. I mean, you could come up with very strong counter arguments, right? Um, there's a rather successful neuroscientist in Colombia University, I think, who is a regular heroin user that declared it, that he's married, has two kids. And he says, well, I like heroin. He's yeah. open about it. Yeah, he's open. Uh, so he was couple, okay couple, with wrote a couple books, said, hey, I learn because I like it. I use it regularly. It doesn't affect my work, it doesn't affect my life. So, <laughs> so like functional, like that's a functional home. user. Right. Yeah. He doesn't even call himself like an addict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he just says, I like it, I use it on a relatively regular basis. I find it very helpful. So that those are the, the other aspects or the other approaches to, to drug use. Uh, he has this whole concept that uh, it's a it's a racial thing. The whole war on drugs is actually a racial war. It's like a stigma. It's a, no, it's aimed against black people. He's black. Oh, he's black. <coughs> so it's from aimed Columbia? against black. Sorry, black from Colombia. Colombia University. Oh, God, sorry, Colombia University. No, no, not Colombia. The, the Columbia, <laughs> Columbia University. As I've said, he's successful in his Um and uh, he said that it's a, it's a racial thing, it's a race uh, uh, aimed to, again, uh, discriminate against the black people. Uh, right. uh, I, I don't know how honest he is, though, by saying that he's a functional family man with oh, he using is. heroin. I mean, bottom line, he, is. he has a family, he seems to be a very happy family, and he's, uh, he's a professor in Columbia University, which is not easy to <laughs> to be in. Uh, it's very competitive. So um, that's a different approach. Uh, another, yeah, there's another successful way to try and get people off drugs and that's to offer them an alternative that also seems to be extremely successful. Um, and again, maybe it's related it relates to the choice, the disorder of choice, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mentioned. Uh, if you offer them an alternative, uh, there's a, there are programs where you come in, if you come in clean, uh, uh, urine samples, blood samples, whatever you use on a regular basis, you come in clean, you get the vouchers of your family, you get the voucher, you don't get money, because money is by itself a trigger, you don't get the money immediately, go out and buy drugs, but you get vouchers to buy all kinds of stuff. In, in all kinds of stores, and, and which works quite a lot. Uh, as long as you're clean, um, you'll get that money. That ex it is extremely successful. It's close to, I don't know, 90 percent, more or less. Interesting. But it's unsustainable. <laughs> you just can't do that for a long term. You get so much money that they bring to you. And, and the moment that you stop giving them uh, the alternative, they run within days. Interesting. It's, and we actually have a model for animals, for, animals uh, for that, exactly. If you give the animals, even well-trained, taking huge amounts of drugs, animals that would work very hard for drugs, if you give them an alternative, like very um, palatable food or interaction with another rat, right. um, they'll shift. Most of them would shift. Again, close to ninety percent, eighty percent of the rest would shift the moment that you take the alternative. That immediately go back for the drug. And you've seen that in your oh yeah yeah we see that in in, yeah. in in studies. That's a very strong model for that. So that's very helpful because people would abstain almost completely. Yeah, they probably cheat here and there, but mostly they will abstain as long as they have the alternative. But it's unsustainable, it cannot keep paying people for their whole life uh, and not being able to make that happen. So there are some programs like that that are considered very successful. The thing is that with that, you need to develop a very strong support system. Mm -hmm. So when, they, when you stop giving them those alternatives, there will be an incentive not to relapse and make their uh, you know, life hard for two drug use. And that's unfortunately not.
not working that well. Uh, but it's an effort that people are doing to put away. Right? Again, all the, the successful experiences in, in drug treatment uh, are based on the will of the users to stop. Um, you try war on drugs and, and uh, applying the law and uh, throwing people in jail. It doesn't do anything. You just end up with a tremendous number of people in jail. It's not that bad, yeah. But the number of people in jail in the United States is the highest in the world, I think. It's ridiculous. It's higher than, higher than Russia, higher than maybe China. Maybe. It's ridiculous. You know, it's, yeah, that's the it's proportion very, of people that are in jail. Right. Because of drugs, by the way. Most of, most of, most of the people in jail are because of drugs and offenses. Right. Uh, so, and it doesn't work, uh, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, there's, at the moment, there's no magic uh, solution. And in my view, that the best thing that we can uh, try to is just to reduce harm. Mm -hmm. and that's the best we can do at the moment. And uh, I really, that's not my area, so I don't know what would be the best uh, <coughs> approach to resolve the problem. Right. Because that, that delves into like the legal and political aspects yeah, it's political, sure. legal around society. The or, uh, I don't know what, what to begin. To reduce homelessness. Is that the first step? The drug problem first. How do you do that? Yeah, it's not too big for me. <laughs> I mean, like it just going back to your research. Like we talked, we talked a lot about your involvement with uh, testing on animals. Um, what, what about humans? Like, have you experimented with? I did very. Uh, yeah, I think in all my career, I've only one study with humans. Now that's that's a very uh, different speciality. There are some people that can do both. I tried to do both, and they're very uh, challenging, expensive. Um, so no, I do. Uh, I don't do. Uh, definitely not in recent years. I don't do any humans uh, research. I could update it. Uh, in our group, there are also people that work with humans. Here, University that work with human addicts. But uh, I don't uh, work with humans, and um, I'm also not into treatment, uh, direct you know, treatment of addictions and illness. That's not um, that's not my area of research. Like we can again, at the underlying brain mechanism, with the hope that if we understand all this better, uh, we know what to do about it. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, and I mean, it's, I think you know, focusing on the the animal behavior definitely reflects what what other people, other scientists in the, in the scientific community can therefore pursue in, uh, on the on the human level. And um, you know, it's it's fascinating to me how the idea of drugs and behavior and the behavioral aspects has been around for so long, but there's still so much research to be done. Right now. Well, yeah, I mean, that's one of the first things that. <laughs> that we tell each other when we meet. Uh, we've been looking into that for uh, 50, 60 years now, and there is so much that we don't really know about. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, frustrating on one side, that we are putting so much effort into understanding, but we are not unique in that respect. This is true for many. Uh, I mean, many fields of research, for example, mental disorders, we don't know exactly what's going on there as well. And that's a big thing today, right? Um, yeah, depression. Everyone talks about depression. We don't really know what's going on there. Schizophrenia, same. Anxiety, all those dis all mental disorders, we're not very good at understanding exactly what's going on. We know much more than we know even five years ago, ten years ago, and there are really amazing studies that are coming out, but we cannot 
right? You cannot open a book and say, okay, depression is this and this, like you open, I don't know, with cancer, right? Or uh, leukemia. This and this and this. And, uh, yeah, so all the, the steps uh, that would uh, cause and lead and uh, prognosis and so on. We don't have that. We have not disordered any of them. Have disordered that. So, so there's a lot to do. Especially yeah, when, you, when you distinguish mental disorders from mental illness. No, right? I mean, it's not. It's the same. I don't need that distinction. Uh, it's just a um, semantic. Uh, it's mental. Things have been adjusted over the years because of the kind of uh, sensitivities and, and uh, correctness and uh, approaches. Uh, we now call it mental disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called mental illnesses. Same idea. We, we do consider that as an illness, as a disorder, uh, with a biological underlying, which we still don't understand. Mm -hmm. Despite all the studies on brain the chemistry, study, all the and studies on brain, we, we, we have ideas, we have concepts, <laughs> uh, well, we know lots about little kind of corners, <laughs> but we do not. We do not have a kind of a, you know, an overall picture of how that might work. In the same way that we have more physio physiological uh, disorders or physiological uh, illnesses. Uh, it's the same. We have we have a lot to do. It's just the brain is so complicated um, that uh, um, we are still struggling. Not only with disease, also normal, normal processes. We are far from understanding what exactly happens. Right. right. And uh, you know, I mean, and I was a couple of years ago. I know it's not going to be your, your field of research, but a couple of years ago, I was uh, reading a book about nutrition, mm -hmm. and it's a locally written book uh, from a Quebec author, and the author was uh, communicating that the intestines actually have their own brain or like their own uh, neurological patterns that are distinct from the brain in and of itself. So I mean, think about the research that can be done on the intestines as an autonomous or semi-autonomous, um, you know, a nervous system in and of itself. Yeah, right? that's something that we ignore, but around the, the gut, there is an extremely sophisticated nervous system right? <laughs> Which that interacts time. with the rest, but yeah, we tend to ignore it, but it's very sophisticated. Right. No, for sure. Uh, I mean, we're closing up on the uh, hour and a half. Actually, we're at an hour thirty-two, and we're reaching pretty much the end of the uh, the interview here. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm glad we covered all this ground. I mean, we, we talked about the, uh, the the mice in the beginning. We even showed the audience like the, the leptin, the effects on leptin up and down. And, um, you know, I injected with with the glucagon and uh, and, and the insulin, and. Uh, you're still, you know, obviously a professor at you know, Concord University, very active in your, in your research. Um, are there any, like, lines of research that you wish to pursue, like new new avenues that you want to go down, like topics that you're interested in delving into? Well, For the it would still, yeah, it, it would still be within, of course, the same, uh, the same field, the same corner of the field. So my uh, interest is in, in the relapse phase of the so that's what I ended up uh, researching the most, and uh, this is my main interest now. So the, the, the near future is working more on the new animal models, uh, animal models for relapse that uh, developed in the lab. That is, uh, I mentioned that you have this choice model where you offer the animals an alternative, but another very effective way to cause animals to abstain, is to punish the drug seeking, uh, which is also what happens in humans. And the main reason that humans uh, abstain, uh, and many users go through sort of those cycles of abuse, yeah. and then they abstain, and then they relapse, and they abuse, and they abstain. It's kind of this vicious cycle. Including punishment. Uh, so the main reason is that there is this concept, uh, that they realize that they are cost. Uh, on many levels is just too much. So they lose their house, they lose their work, they lose their, 
relationships and so on, then that becomes too, you know, too negative, too difficult to bear, and really it's very difficult not to abstain. Mm -hmm. And we try to create the same conditions with the animal where we punish the drug seeking, not the taking itself. The drug taking is always fun. No way around it. <laughs> but the seeking, the how do you get the drug? How do you go around and you look for your dealer or you get the money to get to the dealer? We try to punish that kind of behavior by creating risks. And that works very well. And it can also cause animals to relapse uh, after that. And this is where we're going to take it. This is the loop, uh, the brain mechanisms that underlie this particular behavior. What causes the animals to actually relapse after successfully uh, abstaining from drugs? So that's what we're going to do in the next few years. Interesting, because yeah. um, I mean that's it's a very unique approach when you mentioned it, like uh, to see like if if punishment can be incorporated. But then again, like obviously the tide right now is heavily against punitive measures, and you know. Yeah, but what, in that respect, what we're trying to do is to create a risk. We're not punishing. The drug taking itself or the seeking all the time. We just create a risk. So then we know that there is this proportion of the seeking behavior that they will do, whatever that is, uh, that get, would get punished. Not every time, they can get the drugs every once in a while, and they do. But that risk at some point becomes just too high for them, and they stop. Uh, even though before that they will work very, very the interesting thing is that they stop most of the animals we saw, but we, every once in a while we find those animals that we just not stop. People who can get to the extreme level of punishment um, that we just stop at some point because we think it becomes painful. We try not to be, to, to be with painful punishment, but just annoying ones, so right. not painful. But we can get with those animals, we can go to levels. Uh, that are um, really getting close to, to painful punishment. Interesting. Yeah. And they will keep on. And they will just not. Uh, you don't, don't get understand. enough of those. No, they are, that's a good question. If they don't understand or they're just willing to ignore it. And actually, in humans, it's the same. Lots of people use drugs. About 15 to 20% would actually. Uh, transfer into drug abuse disorders and uh, those we are going to take I guess the very interesting thing and there's a lot of effort to do that is how do you identify those individuals um, because uh, those are the ones that are the problematic ones those are the ones that are very interesting it's just that the way we are running our experiments now we don't get enough of actually do anything with it. We just note that they are there, but we can't do much with them. If we will find a way to get more of those, then um, we will do some research on those individuals. What is special about them that they are willing really to go, regardless of what we throw at them, they'll go for the drug. And that's, so one option is that they are dumb. <laughs> and they don't get the uh, relationship. It's an over, always an option, but we don't think so. I think that they realize the risk and they go for it. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So um, yeah, hopefully, you know, I'm vouching that they they're not as dumb as people may think. But uh, oh no, that's yeah. okay. That's our smart. Right. <laughs> Very yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, just to close things up, uh, I mean, for the, the student audience, or even just the general audience that may be listening to this, um, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with, with regards to, like, your research, uh, things that you have learned, like, in, in, the, in your career, uh, in your studies, like, um, uh, anything that could be motivational or <laughs> <laughs> inspiring for, for academics? Yeah, well, I don't know. Well, I can, all I can say is that uh, I ended up doing something that I really love. Uh, so I find myself, I think of myself as very lucky. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, the usual things that people say, uh, try and do what you like, 
cliche. <laughs> yeah, it's cliche. a very cliche. Yeah. So yeah, try and do what you like. Or in your case, yeah, definitely. folks don't do drugs. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, folks so. don't do drugs. Or at least, <laughs> yeah, uh, don't do too many drugs. Right. Uh, that's uh, thing, but yeah, it's very cliche. But for me, this is what ended up happening. That I was doing something that I really, really like and enjoy very much. And very stimulating. Uh, the one nice thing about academia is that it challenges you continuously. You have right. to learn all the time. Otherwise, there's no room for you. Especially in science, right? Like it's oh, particularly, constantly. yeah. Talking about science in academia, yeah. or research in general, it could be not in academia, but research in particular, it challenges you all the time. If you don't keep up to date, if you don't learn all the time, um, there's no room for you. Right? So that, uh, if you're looking for something like that, <laughs> I would highly recommend that you go into research. Particularly science, but that's my life. There's research in other areas as well. And that's it. Yeah, that's very much it. I mean, yeah, and, and well, one of the main um, motivators to me to invite you on the show is because of your, you know, your research and what I looked at to when on your on your page on the uh, fucking Cordy page. Like I was looking, oops, not here actually, but I was looking through like your um, your research and just the fact that you know psychology is, is such an interesting science because. I've always, you know, being a biochemist by training, I've always considered psychology as this nice hybrid between, or bridge between the pure and applied hardcore sciences and the social sciences, like, because you have neuropsychologists and clinical psych psychologists, and obviously it's, it's, a, diverse, it's a very it's diverse field, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was like the main interest for me to bring you on the show, hopefully you liked it, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the show. And uh, this is the sad part where I get to say like uh, goodbye and that uh, we get to bring this to an end. But I'm, I, I really had fun. I really had fun learning it a lot. Me too. Uh, that was interesting. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned for uh, next, um, actually tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to have the winner of the 3MT for the master's category, software engineer, Maria Duta. She should be on the show tomorrow if everything goes well. And on that note, uh, keep uh, studying hard. And uh, if you're not a student and you're just a a person watching the show, well, then I hope you enjoy and we'll, uh, we'll get you some more guests that have a lot of fun and interesting and educational things to deliver. So, take care. So now I have to like physically go press the button. <laughs> <laughs> it have to be like a one man fits all, or one man does all type of person.